Thank Welcome, you. Welcome, everybody. I'm really thrilled today that we, um, we have this amazing gathering of women uh, today on August 26th, which is the anniversary of women's suffrage, the 100th anniversary of women getting the vote. Um, that was probably an amazing time. But what we all want to talk about today is as an amazing accomplishment as that was that took 100 years, many people worked on it who were not given credit for working on it. And many people, even after we passed the amendment, the 19th Amendment, were still not, did not have access to voting rights. So today we're going to discuss that. I'm Louise Chernin, President and CEO of GSBA, Washington State's LGBTQ Chamber of Commerce. I'm really thrilled that our Women on Top series, this is our very first virtual Women on Top, um, is sponsored by PacMed. PacMed has been a long time sponsor, gold sponsor of GSBA and a supporter of Women on Top, providing a wonderful opportunity for women and women identified women and gender diverse women to get together, uh, which we did quarterly. This one will be virtually. So we'd like to um, give Dr. Lisa Ivanjack a moment to, to welcome us and we want to thank her for her many years of support of GSBA, the LGBTQ community, and specifically Women on Top. Dr. Ivanjack. Thank you so much, Louise. Welcome everyone to the first virtual GSBA Women on Top event. Thank you for being here today with us to, as we explore and discuss this very important topic. My name is Dr. Lisa Ivanjack. I'm the new Chief Medical Officer for Pacific Medical Centers, and we are proud to support the GSBA in this event series annually. It is an honor to be a part of this community and to participate in the change so many of you in this virtual room drive each and every day in your lives and in the lives of others. Today, you'll join esteemed guests and speakers on the 100 year anniversary of our right to vote as women. And even though this is a historical milestone to celebrate, we must acknowledge where the victory did not create equality for all women equally. Even though laws reserving the ballot for men became unconstitutional, women still had to navigate vast disparities in access. Women who showed up to vote were confronted with a difficult road ahead, racism being the most significant hurdle. Poll taxes, literacy tests, grandfather clauses, and unchecked intimidation disenfranchised black, brown, and indigenous communities. PacMed supports the value in action to make voting more equitable and more accessible for all. We encourage mail-in ballots, allowing for time to exercise your right to vote and discussing tough topics within our own organization that need to be addressed for a more equitable future for black, brown, and indigenous caregivers, their families, and our patients. Women, work, women continue to work against voter suppression and for full access to the polls. So I encourage everyone here today to vote, 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 vote. Our voice matters and it is so important. To quote former President Barack Obama, you can give our democracy new meaning. You can take it to a better place. But here's the thing, no single American can fix this country alone. We all need to continue to work together. Thank you so much for having me here today. And I'm so excited to uh, participate in this series. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Ivan Jack. And again, thanks for all your support. So we're gonna get started. This really is a historical moment and it's also a historic gathering. These are some of the most amazing women in our community. They are movers and shakers. They are not afraid to cause, as uh, John Lewis said, good trouble. And so I'd like to first welcome our moderator. She has been, she's a long-term activist in this community. Many of you might have known her from her days at the YWCA, Seattle King County in Snohomish. Others know her because she's run for office, others because she is everywhere trying to get people civically engaged, to be thoughtful, to make changes. Um, she is just a dear person in our community. We are so privileged to have her. She is now at At Work and she is today's moderator, Alicia Crank. Thank you so much, Louise, and thank you for inviting me to moderate this discussion today. Uh, I am so excited to be joined by our panelists. We have Sally Clark, who is the Director of Regional and Community Outreach for the University of Washington. 
Colleen Echohawk, the Executive Director of Chief Seattle Club, and Lanisha DeBartelaven, who is the Executive Director of Northwest African American Museum. And again, there's so many other things that each of those women do in the community, so I am, again, grateful to be in their company. Women's Equality Day commemorates the passage of the 19th Amendment, granting the right to vote to women. However, most Asian American, Native American, and African American women still face barriers in attempting to vote. It took the Indian Citizenship Act, the Magnuson Act of 1943, and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 to get us to all. So today, we know that our vote is more important than ever. In the 100 years since its ratification, as a country, we have taken giant leaps forward as well as significant steps back. With voter suppression still evident, our vote has the power to make our voices stronger and louder. So now I really wanna to start to take this over to our panelists. So my question for Sally is, how is it that we don't know what we don't know? Thanks, Alicia, and I really want to thank you for being willing to um, facilitate today, and, and thanks to the GSBA for keeping uh, this event going and having it be really meaningful during COVID and during this historical moment as well. So this is um, fantastic, and thanks to everybody who's joining us today. So I, I'm going to take that question and, and um, talk a little bit in a broader sense before we then pivot to the, to the other two panelists. And when, uh, when I was originally talking with Louise about this panel, there was the question of, so what, how is it that we don't know what we don't know in our, in our learning for many of us, you know, learning kind of freshly every day, elements of history. When, um, when we've all been around for a little while, um, some of us longer than others, and we, uh, we think that we know history, you know, we think that we know when women got the vote and that makes it super clean and easy. Uh, but that's not totally the case. So that's, that's kind of my premise for, for how to talk about what is it that we learn and how do we learn it? And how do we then take charge of trying to make sure that we do a better job of helping other people learn history going forward? So, you know, as we've already noted, um, the 19th Amendment, it did not guarantee the right to vote for all women. But that's not something that we all learn in school. Uh, it's not something that most kids in the United States learn. Um, and why is that? It's, it's really, you know, I think there are a number of ways to say it that aren't great, but, um, you know, one of, the, one of the shorthand terms is history is, is written by the winners, and that's a terrible way to say it. And unfortunately, to some degree, it also bears true when you look at some of, uh, some of um, historical narratives. Uh, and that's because we don't, we don't do a good job of talking about the things that uh, perhaps are, are, not perhaps, but are shameful parts of history or places where groups of people and individuals made, made, made to, um, to use shorthand again, a mistake. So it's shameful that Black women, Native women, um, Asian women were left behind, um, having been so much a part of the work. Historical narratives are almost almost, almost um, always a little less nuanced. They always uh, almost always include a little less of the inconvenient information. And we'll talk about that again in a second. History is almost always a story of power balances, right? Um, I think a lot of women who are tuning into this call know very well that history is a story of power balances and how how people um, um, strive to to make a better power balance to to make more equal equilibrium, if you will. And you know, the American story, um, the North American story, the United States story, as we as we deal with language there, is has always complicated. So this idea that that has been a part of the um, the dominant narrative for the United States about a melting pot has always been complicated, right? Um, I don't know if people were listening to NPR this morning, but they're they're doing this series of interviews with. Um, likely voters for November, and there was an interview with a couple living in um, Arizona, um, outside of Tucson, I think, and um, she was talking how she really wants to hear more about people being um, together, about bringing narratives together, and less about difference. And I, I think as, as many of us are listening to her story, we're trying to figure out, well, yeah, I mean, I think we all want to figure out how we come together, how we work towards common goals, towards um, towards uh, prosperity and opportunity, but glossing over those differences and glossing over the power imbalances has always been the, the, the difficulty. 
and a lot of this country depends, the, the dominant narratives have depended on this idea of shared values and a shared sense of history and opportunity. But digging deeper, we know that the history is more complicated than that. Um, we know that the founding documents are more complicated than that. The Declaration of Independence and the Constitution are, are uh, foundational and flawed, both at the same time. So uh, let's take this to how we learn about history very briefly. I should also note, I'm on the business side of the University of Washington. I am not an academic, so I'm talking about history here. I have absolutely no um, academic training to talk about history, but I'm going to do it anyway. And uh, how, you know, the ways that we learn the history of who we are, um, whether that's as an individual or who we are as part of a community or as part of the world, we learn it in all sorts of ways, right? Uh, we learn it in our families. We learn it in the photographs that our families keep in scrapbooks. We learn it in the narratives that are passed down about who our families are and, and what that means to us about who we are within a family construct. But we also learn it through um, books and poems and music and movies, uh, very much so through movies. And uh, we learn it through school. School is, is asked to do so many things in our, in our society and school is definitely the place where we really, um, we really focus what is the way that we transmit narratives about who we are. Uh, and that makes school pretty complicated, right? So for me, um, speaking personally, I attended uh, predominantly white schools in public schools in Southwest Portland. And I can't speak highly enough of the teachers that I had, but as we're adults, you know, we look back and we see the gaps. And I recognize that that what I learned, the curriculum and the teachers and what they were what they were um, trained in and based in, uh, they didn't they didn't ask inconvenient questions. And you know, in fourth and fifth grade, not you know, a lot of us don't know uh, the kids in that environment don't know the inconvenient questions yet. And we didn't, I think, as we would say now, really lift up the voices that did ask inconvenient questions. And so history in terms of what we, um, for people like me, learned in school was very much in the textbook, was very much in sort of a dominant media of the time and didn't, didn't identify a lot of these questions. And I didn't have, um, I did not have a way or um, an environment in which I recognized what those issues were. We could have done a lot better. We could have done so much better. And I think there have been improvements. I, I don't, I, I would not say at all that we're where we need to be, but you know, even at that time when I was going through school, how did we not educate kids in Portland, Oregon, or in Seattle, Washington, or Bremerton, or wherever we are today? At a minimum, how did we not educate kids on the rich history of the Native Americans in the lands in which we are living? How did we not do that? Um, how did we not do a better job of educating about the contributions and started also from an asset-based perspective? the contributions of Chinese and Japanese Americans in the Northwest? How did we not talk about the rich histories of African Americans who came West hoping to find a fairer playing field? Uh, we, did a, we did a terrible job of that and we continue to not, not do a great job of it. I don't think my experience is that out of the ordinary probably for, for um, some people listening to this today, watching this today. And uh, the, the great thing is, um, going back to the, to the focus of, of why we're talking about the vote and why it's so important in this year in particular, there are things that we can do differently. And um, I'll just, I'll give an example. And it, it takes me to, as a former elected official, I, I think about other elected officials, maybe more than some of the rest of you do. <laughs> One level of government that never gets enough respect, ever, um, it's school boards. And school boards end up being fundam fundamental when we talk about one method in which we talk about history and one way in which we transmit history to the coming generations. So most of you know more about this than I do because you've had um, kids go through the system, but, but in general, let's just walk through a couple of things here. So in general, states in the United States kind of determine what it takes to graduate from high school. It's roughly the same state to state, but those standards of what it takes to graduate from high school um, go on to college, um, be successful in a, in a job, um, either coming out of high school or, or going through college, choosing to, to go into the military, choosing to um, go into trades, whatever that is. There's a certain sort of commonality of expectation. And that usually focuses on things like math and reading literacy and things like that. More and more though, I think we're recognizing that um, school curriculum concepts deal with much more than that. And that those things are extremely important to how we engage as a community together. 
Um, anybody who's had kids in multiple school districts knows that there are similarities, again, among those expectations, but there are vast differences. And, and I think we recognize that as we you know, read about um, conflicts in different parts of the United States. Um, how curriculum reflects, reflects our history, that's an ongoing body of work and we will never be finished with it and we have to stay engaged with it. That's a fantastic place for people to look at um, what, uh, what you and we can do together to support school boards or run for school board um, to be a part of those decisions. And uh, there's one example I wanna highlight um, from Seattle Public Schools that I think is, is an interesting example and it, it combines young people as well as those in leadership, uh, administrative leadership now. So um, I think for, for some folks, you'll, 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 this will resonate with you, ethnic studies um, used to be in, and still is in parts of our country, the study of just other people. That's, that's the way it's seen, right? It's seen as other people, you know, I'm, what do I need ethnic studies for? Uh, and at the same time, I think there's such a more nuanced, such a better and more advanced conversation happening, particularly at the college level and high school levels about ethnic studies and what it actually can be and how it can help um, really uh, broaden what we understand about history and what we understand about each other in this country. Um, you know, we should be, uh, we should also be honest that in the past, you know, again, this othering of what, eth what ethnic studies is about is part of a colonial history about how these narratives have been set up about other cultures sort of centered on white, uh, whites being in the center and saying that other, other folks are not in the center. Mm -hmm. And being able to dissemble that is really, um, disassemble that is extremely important. The example from Seattle Public Schools is in 2017, the NAACP's Youth Council, and I, I should also say some of you may have been a part of this, so I apologize if I, if I don't know that you were a part of this. The Youth Council advocated for Seattle Public Schools to expand and improve its ethnic studies to include a wider array of voices and histories. And to their credit, Seattle Public Schools stood up a task force of citizens and staff at that time, and that task force has been at work refashioning the ethnic studies to decenter whiteness and to dismantle that colonial eye and instead race and ethnicity as cultural, social, and political forces can be the focus of that work mm -hmm. and that study. Uh, and if you've been a part of that work, you know that it has not been simple for Seattle Public Schools. It has had its ups and downs, but uh, checking in with them recently, I know that it is continuing and it is supported by Superintendent Juno and by the school board so that it continues to have legs. And I know that um, Superintendent Juno is actually meeting with the, the current iteration of the NAACP's Youth Committee this week um, to talk about progress and the work still to come to continue to make ethnic studies a really powerful part of the curriculum and a really complementary part of the curricul curriculum for producing great thinkers coming out of Seattle Public Schools who will be great citizens of our world. I hope so, and, and I and I think you're 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 right, especially when you talk about school boards, because I think now more well probably now because of everything that's been COVID related, there is a spotlight on good. on school boards right now and the things that we need to do. Thank you so much for that, Sally. That's good. I was right at my end. My last okay. one was wrote. This is what matters. School boards don't overlook them. At least yeah. you were right on it. Thank you for being an awesome facilitator. Thank no, you. No problem. <laughs> and so I want to pivot over to, to Colleen now, because again, something that you said when you talk about ethnic studies, and you also, and I think about my time in school, both high school and college, and when we talked about voting rights in the 19th Amendment, it was very focused on the African American experience, because I grew up in Detroit, so that, that made sense to me. But I never thought about other nationalities and communities within the United States. So Colleen, let me ask you, um, can you talk more about how Native, Native women have been involved in this movement? And hopefully you're not muted. I just unmuted myself. <laughs> okay. The first time and many times I'll do that today. Hi everybody, I'm so glad to be with you all and to take just a minute to talk a little bit about um, Native women and um, our rights to vote and the importance of our voice. Um, I, I just um, am so grateful for this opportunity. I just want to say thank you to GSBA, to my friend and role model, Elise, and uh, my friend and role model, Alicia. I'm just glad to be with you guys. It feels good in this virtual room that we're in. Um, you know, I want to um, share with you all a little bit of a, a story that happened to me about 
uh, eight years ago. Um, I went to a conference um, and I, maybe you've had this experience when you go to a conference and you make a conference buddy. And like we hung out and we had such a good time, became great friends. Uh, we, you know, I remember us like going out and dancing to like the 80s rock band that the conference had and just having like this, this fun time together. And I also remember, you know, two years ago now sitting on my, my couch and watching the same woman get elected to Congress, the same na this native woman, Sharice Davids, being elected to Congress. And even when I tell you that right now, I, I have like these chills and goosebumps on me. And I, I remember that moment just like kind of screaming and crying and bringing my kids over and, and saying, that's your auntie. Like this is, this is a person that we know that is going to make a difference for our community. When I walk the halls of Congress to do the lobbying that I do every year, it's different because this is someone who knows me, who knows my experience, who knows what it's like to um, be a Native woman. And I think, you know, we were so lucky in that, um, that year too to have Deb Harland um, also be elected. This is an, an amazing time for, for Native women um, to see that kind of example in, in, our, in our halls of Congress, but it wasn't always like that, you know? Um, I wanted to read a quote from um, Michigan Senator Jacob um, Howard in 1866, um, when the, fourth, um, amend, uh, the 14th Amendment was being passed, making all persons that were born in the United States um, citizens, but Indians on reservations, Native people were excluded. And, and this Senator Wright wrote this, he said, I am not yet prepared to pass a sweeping act of neutralization by which all the Indian savages, wild or tame, belonging to a tribal relation are to become my fellow citizens and go to the polls and vote with me. To me, that's really remarkable. It set the tone and continues to set a tone about who Native community are, who, who, who we belong to, and do we belong in this new country that was being created on our own homelands. And then we know that we're celebrating today, and I celebrate it along with you, the, the rights um, for all female citizens in the United States to vote. But we know that that did not include Native people because it wasn't until 1924 that Native Americans born within the United States had citizenship. The Indian Citizen Act, um, Act was passed in 1924, four years after um, US uh, female citizens were given the right to vote. Then that still did not take care of the problem because there was so much discrimination, so much prejudice against Native folks. And I invite you to, to take a look at the history because I'm not gonna be able to go into all of it right now. But there was many, many um, uh, situations that did not allow for Native people and Native women to vote. Um, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, finally did outlaw the exclusionary practices that deny or bridge the right of any citizen of the United States to vote on account of race and color. But still there was tremendous pop, um, um, situations that continue to ensure that Native folks do not have um, the same access, the same rights to voting. Um, we are also the community that has, are, are the least likely to come out for the vote. Um, there are many things, and I'm just gonna cover a couple of them really quickly. Um, there's uh, isolating um, conditions such as language barriers. We still have many Native folks who thankfully um, still speak another, um, the first language of their community, the Navajo community, the Crow community, the um, Athabascan community, which I'm from in, in, in Alaska. Many of our um, elders um, speak the, the language as they should. Um, there's also a tremendous amount of socioeconomic disparities. Um, Native people have some of the highest rates of poverty in our country. There's lack of access to transportation. If you live in a rural reservation and you're pulling um, place is 50 miles away, there is a very uh, big barrier there to get out to the um, to vote. Um, there's lack of residential addresses. Um, my, many of them are, are out on the reservations, they have post offices, they don't have physical residences. Um, and so that has also caused a tremendous amount of, bar of barriers. Um, if you are homeless, um, and you do not have um, a residence, then that is also a huge problem. I, I am 100% behind um, mail-in voting, but we have to imagine what it's like for our folks who are experiencing homelessness. We know that in King County, the region we live in right now, 
15% of our homeless population is Native American. And um, we only make up less, we make up less than 1% of the total population. So there's a tremendous situation there that we have to get out and get moving in. And I wanted to say, um, as I close out my time, that there is tremendous movement within the Native community. The National Congress of American Indians our national organization is moving forward so fast and move and and in and, and all kinds of incredible um uh money and um ideas are being like lifted up to our native um communities all around the country um i was able to participate last year um, last august in the very first native american presidential forum in sioux city iowa mm -hmm. a tremendous opportunity where we had bernie sanders there we had elizabeth warren there we had um, so many of the candidates who were running at the time there and participated in a forum where we got to sit on stage with them and and live um, stream it all around the country. So um, Indian country is on the move. We are going to be bringing in more and more Native people into this, um, into this uh, voting community and remind them that even though this is um, we are we are faced with a situation where we are incredibly disenfranchised with our government. But it is our opportunity, it is our power, it is um, the the lifeblood of of the democracy that we're in is that voting. And so we're going to be doing it. We're going to be encouraging everyone around the country. And I invite you to share everything I just mentioned to you all so that more and more people know about what it's like as for a Native person to be voting. Um, thank you again for this amazing time. It was awesome to be with you. Now, Colleen, thank you so much. And I, and I know that people are probably furiously writing notes about what you said and what Sally has said so far in the references. So I do know that we will be sharing links to some of these things um, right after the event. So if you missed anything, anybody, don't worry. We will make sure that you have um, reference points to the different acts that have been talked about. So you, and of course, the, the last one that we was mentioned here was the Voting Rights Act. And so I'm so happy that uh, Lanisha is able to join us to talk about um, what that really meant. So Lanisha, I guess my question for you is, what is the role that Black women have played in the suffrage movement? Absolutely, Alicia, thank you so much. And thanks to Louise and Toroya and GSBA for inviting the Northwest African American Museum to be a part of today's conversation. And I'm always so grateful to share time with Sally and Colleen. I'd like us to begin with the end in mind. The end goal is a woman in the highest office in the land, the presidency of the United States. And we now see it as a possibility because of what black women for centuries have been doing, agitating, advocating, and advancing. Now we sitting here on the Zoom call cannot even begin to imagine the cataclysmic oppression and suppression they in previous generations were under and steal their roles politically and civically, as Maya Angelou says. And it began with a woman named Mariah. She was the first officially documented black woman public political activist in the United States. She was born in 1803 in Connecticut. She was a protege of David Walker who wrote Walker's Appeal. And Mariah Stewart said, quote, if no one will promote and respect us, let us promote and respect ourselves. We think of women like Sojourner Truth, born enslaved, 1797, but self-emancipated herself and spoke out for women's rights. She is most known for her famous 1851 Women's Rights Convention speech. We have to thank women like Ida B. Wells, who was a crusader for women's rights. She started the Alpha Suffrage Club in the early 1900s and traveled the world speaking out against lynching and for women's rights. Women like Anna Julia Cooper, who was born enslaved 1854, but rose to become the intellectual powerhouse of the black feminist movement of her day. She was the first black woman to receive a PhD in history. So she's my personal, <laughs> personal hero. And, but she had to go overseas to Paris to obtain that degree in 1925. Anna Julia Cooper is known for saying, quote, 
Only the black woman can say when and where I enter in the quiet, undisputed dignity of my womanhood without violence and without suing or special patronage. Then and there, the whole Negro race enters with me. And in addition to those individuals, we have to thank several organizations who were so critical to bringing these Black women together to agitate, advocate, and advance themselves. Organizations like the National Association of Colored Women, founded 1896. Why? Because the National Association of Women would not accept Black women. So they organized their own association and they're still active today, 2020, with the wonderful motto called Lifting As We Climb. We have to thank organizations like those Black women sororities, such as mine, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, founded in 1908. Organizations like the National Council of Negro Women, founded in 1935 by Mary McLeod Bethune. So these Black women organizations built political and civic networks for Black women who were excluded from mainstream organizations. These Black women and their organizations led the way. And lastly, I wrap up by acknowledging the Black women historians who keep these stories alive. Historians like Rosalind turgborg Penn and Dr. Darlene Clark Hine. They're a part of the Association of Black Women Historians, which is a collective of Black women historians who are fully dedicated to the work of telling these stories so that one day when a woman is both holding the vice presidency and the presidency in this country at the same time, they and we will all know the road that was taken to get there. Thank you all so much for your time today. And yes, we salute the, all the other sororities as well, Dr. Sigma Theta Sorority 1913, who they were a part of that women's suffrage march in Washington, DC, all of the black women organizations. And there is a handout that will be provided with all this information. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lanisha. And I know that you're, you're in transit right now. So we pre completely appreciate you carving out time to be with us. Um, if anything right now, we've, if you take anything away from what's been discussed so far is that this is purely a women's movement. It's not a black women's movement. It's not a white woman's movement that we all have to do this together. And there's still so much work that has to be done so that we stay collective. So you've heard from us. Now it's time for all of you to talk. So we are going to start our breakout session. And there should be five sessions and our facilitators will be Alona and Laurie, Aquinda Adams, Louise Chernin, Amy Verdict, and Christina Arrington. So you should be receiving a notification to go into your breakout session and we'll see you when you come back out. All right, everybody, welcome back. I'm sure that you had a great discussion, albeit probably felt very short. So my hope is that post event that everyone will continue this conversation in their homes or in their workplaces. I'm now going to ask each of the facilitators um, to talk about one common theme or one common point that came out of your breakout discussion. And I want to first start with Alona. Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, our group uh really got stuck on the first question about what were you taught about the women's suffrage um, movement and um, it came out that it was a very white perspective um, that was taught in school. Um, most everybody heard about Susan B. Anthony but that was just about it and uh, it seemed easily solved and everybody moved on equally. That was kind of the common theme that everybody learned in school. Um, and as people got older, they realized this is, you know, there is a, a tip of the iceberg that's, that's discovered, especially also during the past few months. And now people are looking more below the waterline to see what is actually this huge iceberg that is lying, laying beneath. Hmm. So this is kind of the theme that get, came through on our group. Wow, oh, thank you for sharing that. I, I completely relate to that. And Quita, what about your group? 
I think we collectively um, share that. Sorry about the music in the background if you hear it. You guys already know. Um, I think we collectively understood that we were not taught, um, especially in elementary school, and that we had to actually um, bring it to ourselves to like go out and do the work of understanding history. Um, and also, um, I actually informed everybody how they can get involved on a local and a, a level that's in Olympia. So I think we had a great time kind of understanding how they can get involved because they were wanting to know like how they need to get involved. Thank you for that. Okay, Louise, how was your group? Well, we had a great group. Um, of course, we wish we had a little bit more time to talk, but I, I, I you know, the same thing in, in terms of Alona about, you know, it was a white perspective, but I do want to say people felt we were a very wide range of ages as well. And people really felt that they're going to work, their work is going to focus on their um, maybe uh, communities they come from, not where they are now, but families uh, that they might not have as much contact with anymore, but really go try to go to their family of origin and try to change some perspectives and get people involved in the vote. And if there is a moment, I'm just going to say this because Rachel Brista is working on um, it's called Drag Out the Boat, and maybe if we have time after, she could say something about it because it's an exciting program. Great. Thank you for sharing that. Amy, how about your, your group? Hi. Yeah, we had a wonderful group as well. I think um, the, the, the basic theme was perhaps that we don't always know what we don't know, of course, and that... Um, Perhaps if we have young children and we don't, they don't necessarily always have the tools necessary to uh, to grow up and understand what history is about. And I think uh, Sally Clark was in our group, and one point that she made was to say, "Don't we always look back and say, what I wish we would have known that, and that right now we have an opportunity." to really educate and to get involved and so that in 20 years those people we don't again say what did we miss why didn't we do this and so i think this is just a sort of an aha moment to really get involved to get educated because that was another common theme around history uh, and that we need to do a much better job uh, not just in schools because that is of course where it starts but also in our communities no absolutely thank you for that and, and christina how about your group yeah, we had a great discussion uh, and along the lines of a lot of the others, it's just, we were all taught that everything is fixed. And so, you know, done in 1920, slavery is abolished, we can move on. Uh, what kind of political purpose does that serve to teach the fact that things are done? Um, I also want to point uh, really quickly to two ideas that were wonderful uh, to focus on. First is the Secretary of State election taking place in Washington here. Washington does have mail-in ballots, but as uh, was referenced earlier, some people need in person. Uh, there is still quite a lot that can be done to shore up our elections. And so focusing on that. Um, and then uh, Reclaim Our Vote is a program or initiative where you can postcard, you can call, uh, but it's reaching out to folks who have been cleared off the rosters. And so trying to reach out to people who are disenfranchised and it can be all around the country. And so uh, working with our families and our own community is so powerful, uh, but we also have the opportunity to reach out a little bit further and try and reach folks who have been disenfranchised. Thank you for that. This has been such a great way to start a Wednesday. I feel like there's been so much energy in our virtual room um, and a lot of great ideas and information that's been shared. And I totally enjoyed moderating this discussion. I'm going to turn it back over to Louise for closing comments and to sign us off. Great. Uh, thank you, Alicia. And huge thanks to Alicia and Lanisha uh, and Sally and Colleen. Uh, we will have resources after. Um, is, is, is Rachel Brista um, still available? Can you unmute and tell us about um, um, Drag the Vote Out? Drag Out the yeah. Vote? Yeah, sure, I'm still here. Um, so Drag Out the Vote is a new uh, national organization that um, the company I work for is um, helping to support and do a lot of the marketing for. So it's basically mobilizing the art of drag and drag queens to help um, to help get people registered to vote and get out the vote because 
the statistic that um, we have seen, and uh, I can't quote you as to where it's from right now, um, but that one in five LGBTQ people are not registered to vote. And when um, I saw that, I was shocked. Um, so drag out the vote, basically, we have hundreds of drag ambassadors from all across the country who are working within their own communities to get their, um, their audience, their constituents um, registered to vote. Uh, and it's through performance and social media and there's been a lot of press. They, uh, we just had a segment on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. So if you, I'll put the link in the chat if you wanna check it out. And there's a couple of queens here from Seattle that are involved, but all 50 states have, have a drag or multiple drag ambassadors. So it's kind of exciting. Thank you, Rachel. Thank so, you. I mean, I think what's clear to me from all of this is really, I don't think education has changed that much. Sally, I know you're still on the call, but we had a young person on our call saying they didn't learn anymore. So here we are a hundred years later. Um, I wanted to, I had said this to folks before, but when I first found out about, you know, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, and I, I read a lot because I worked for the National Organization for Women in the 80s, um, I was very surprised to learn, and I did learn then, that Native American women, uh, the Iroquois women specifically, played a very huge role in the 1848 Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls, New York. And uh, because the Iroquois women come from a matrilineal society, and uh, they experience equality, equality, uh, the men and women, and, um, and I'm sure a trans community or two-spirited community from the Native American community, it was much more equality. And so Elizabeth Cady Stanton actually spent a lot of time uh, with Iroquois women and learning from them. And they did help in the drafting of the uh, women's rights, the Statement of Women's Rights in 1848, but were then later given no credit for that. And of course, there was also, there were LGBTQ, there were lesbian women's suffragists also. Um, we know about letters and correspondence. Their story is also not told. Um, and of course, uh, black women um, were, were, did not have the vote. And then we had the Voting Rights Act. And I just wanna say the importance right now, as we know the Vi Voting Rights Act uh, not long ago was rolled back and significantly weakened by our US Supreme Court and people are being disenfranchised again all over the country, most specifically in the South, but all over. Um, and we know the US mail uh, for mail-in ballots is at risk and mailboxes have been removed. So it's really important now to be writing to ensure that people can do mail-in voting, especially with the pandemic currently going on, but also uh, how many polling places have been closed, how many people will have hours to wait uh, during dangerous times with the pandemic and have to wait on lines with with children and whatnot. So it's, it's a very sorry state that as we're celebrating 100 years, we have way rolled back, even though we have a Voting Rights Act, but it's weakened. So, and of course, our um, Chinese uh, um, American women, our uh, other Asian women, uh, there was the, um, they had, I can't remember the year of their Voting Rights Act, but it, it has been piecemeal. And I do want to say, because Sally mentioned the Constitution and the Declaration of Rights, I know everybody holds the, the Constitution up as the most haloed document in the world, but I just have to say it was created with none of us in mind. No woman, no person of color was included in our Constitution. And we have spent hundreds of years now piecemeal trying to put things in. So I'm not sure why we have such great respect for a document that actually was intended only for white landed men. Um, so it is, um, it is a sorry state in our country that that's what we hold up as an example to all fight for. So I hope we all get engaged. I think voting is essentially important. We have a woman of color, a black woman on the ticket this year. Um, but even more than that, we have amazing local women of color, black and brown women running for office everywhere. And they really need our support because I believe that's what's gonna change things locally. So I want to thank you for being involved. Uh, GSBA has a public policy group um, and we're going to be doing things, civic engagement webinars um, starting each month through election. Do all we can to get out the vote, drag out the vote, drag out your neighbors, whatever it takes, speak to your families, especially if they live in more conservative areas, fight to keep our US post office. And most of all, I want to again, thank the women um, 
all of you that, and the uh, women, women identified women and, and our allies that have participated in today's discussion, because it is because of you that we can still even talk about voting rights. Um, let's all get engaged and support our movement for racial justice right now. It is about time. It's, it seems like every few years we say it's about time and then we don't actually accomplish all that much and let us hope things are different now. But thank you, stay safe, stay well. And we at GSBA so appreciate all you do every day. Thank you again. Thanks, Alicia and Lanisha and Colleen and Sally. Take care. Bye-bye.